Hello and welcome to Straightforward Levant TV's political talk show focusing on the Middle East and related events affecting the region. France is emerging from one of its worst security crises in decades after three days of terror attacks brought bloodshed to Paris and its surrounding areas. It began with a massacre at the offices of satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, killing a dozen, followed by an attack on a kosher store in the capital, ending with two sieges and a huge police operation two days later. But it seems this end would be just the beginning. Let me first welcome our guest here at the studio, British political commentator Mr. William Spring, and uh, Mr. Abdul Al Andalusi, activist, Muslim activist, and debater. Welcome on the show. Before we delve into our potentially controversial discussion, I must say our thoughts go to the free media of France and the world. Here at Levant TV in London, we were perhaps the first to label the Islamic State as a terrorist organization. We voiced concerns over bringing terror back to European soil. And just as we start our discussion, let's have a look at this brief report. Yet another cartoon controversy affected the whole world. The French journey Charlie Hebdo published cartoons of Muhammad the Prophet of Islam, the Parisian cartoonists that are very well known for targeting all faiths. But in addition to the caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad, another possible motive for the attack that was cited Wednesday is the disrespect of the Islamic State Emir Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The Islamic State is an enormous attraction for Muslim extremists in the West. Intelligence experts in the US administration believe that the group is immensely more skilled than Al-Qaeda in terms of recruiting through the social networks. This attack is expected to unleash all the old demons that most Europeans would prefer to ignore. Even in normal times, there are questions regarding the assimilation of Muslim immigrants in Western Europe, the influence of inflammatory clerics on young Muslims, and the extreme responses by all streams of Islam to any insult. The Jewish community seems to be on the list time and time again. Attacks committed by Muslims with French citizenships were carried out by fighters from Syria, like last year witnessed an attack on the Jewish Museum in Brussels, or by criminals who had undergone an ideological radicalization like those who attacked the Jewish school in Toulouse in 2012. The latest attack in Paris is certainly not reassuring for Israel either. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu adamantly went to Paris where he urged Jews to go to the homeland for safety. The somewhat unprecedented rally in Paris last Sunday was led by the French President Francois Hollande and his counterparts from Europe and the rest of the world, many of which were criticized for their own harassment of free press in their respective countries. Washington seemed to have admitted fault by not attending the rally. A White House statement said, It is fair to say we should have sent someone with a higher profile. But what does the nationality of the terrorist attackers tell us about this growing threat? And what does their religion have to do with it? And should terrorism in Europe be considered a foreign import or an evil radicalization of Islam that is cultivated and flourishing on European soil? Mr. Mr. Spring, what, are you, what is your take on the attacks in Paris? I think it's a consequence, to, in many respects, of uh, UK and US foreign policy. When you say consequence, does that justify the act? No, not at all, no. Um, what I'm saying is, we had a foreign secretary here, hmm. William Haig, who did all he could to encourage people to go to Syria to fight President Assad. Mm -hmm. um, now, the West, for some reason, Monsieur Hollande and the new government of Britain, they have taken the view that they must get rid of Assad. It's a psychopathic view. They don't seem to have any rationality behind it. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, they are saying to the, um, Muslims, we're on your side. But what about, you the, be what on about our side. the act of killing free journalists, their satirical cartoonists? Well, number one, I don't, don't regard uh, Epto in one sense as a satirical magazine, not in the English sense, because mm. satire is not insulting your opponent. It's much more subtle than that. But, the, but the Europe is not about English standards in media. No, no, but we know a lot about satire. Mm. And, I mean, we've got our own satirical magazines, mm. which are fairly well written, uh, Charlie Hebdo seemed almost like a comic, but how be it with extremely inflammatory comment? Mm -hmm. um, 
one, what one says in England is you never really insult the other chap's religion. But that's British political correctness, yes. of course. Mm. Abdullah al-Andalusi, where do your thoughts go upon these events and why does it seem like democracy it tends not to be compatible with many versions of Islam? Um, I don't think it's the case that uh, Islam mandated the killing of, of people merely because they portray a depiction of Prophet Muhammad uh, we, be, we don't believe that non-Muslims should follow uh, Islamic theological edicts on the issue of the portrayal of prophets. Certainly Jesus and Moses are also prophets of Islam as well. Um, but rather, I think that the, the, the issue is a part to do with, with certainly foreign policy. This was, these were two Al-Qaeda trained individuals. They were trained outside of France and they were sent into France, so to speak, with a mission uh, to a, a achieve as part of Al-Qaeda's international objectives. So certainly foreign policy is the key. That These were not uh, lone wolf, uh, do-it-yourself uh, terrorists. Um, and secondly, the Muslim um, but community But they, are, they France, are French people, though. They are French citizens. Well, as I said, secondly, the French community uh, feel under siege by uh, the uh, Islamophobia, by the demonization, the discrimination, the laws that deny them uh, the equal freedoms. They can't pray in public. They can't. Women can't wear niqab. They can't wear a hijab in in in, to, to, in schools. They're banned from doing protests, uh, pro-Palestine protests. France it doesn't believe in free speech, and it strongly discriminates the Muslim community. So, out of that milieu of anger and hatred, there are many people who go, who are going to react, and unfortunately. Uh, uh, we see the events uh, uh, occur, and this is not the first time that minorities, you've had criminal elements in minorities, we're in, we're in Europe, uh, who've reacted to the persecution of these yes. minorities. But back to democracy, specifically democracy, you said France doesn't have uh, a notion of free rights. Now, uh, what about Islam itself? Is it compatible with democracy when it comes to freedom of expression? Well, well first, uh, I think the question is, is, is democracy compatible with freedom of expression? That was initially. Certainly, yes, yeah, certainly the, the, the majority, the, the, the taboos of the majority outweighs the taboos of the minority. And I think you see this hypocrisy, is why you see hypocrisy throughout many Western governments uh, in terms of how they silence some minorities and they allow majorities to demonize and so on. These, but we see some... that in the East as well, under the caliphate of uh, the so-called Islamic State, we see minorities not only harassed but brutally murdered. So, uh, but but uh, but this is this is not a uh, a duly constituted state. Uh, these are uh, uh, militias. Uh, they've got into to power, and it's a very uh, the, it's a war zone basically. It's an ongoing it's an ongoing war zone there. There are many people don't talk about the Islamic groups uh, in Syria, which don't attack minorities, which don't attack Christians, which don't mm -hmm. attack mm -hmm. uh, uh, others. And uh, but we always focus on. Uh, ISIS, why not uh, fo focus on the majority of armed Islamic groups who are fighting uh, a Bashar Assad who don't attack but, minorities? Uh, regardless from the situation in Syria, it takes just a couple of Muslims for a big disaster to happen. That's why Islam is not targeted, but it's in the spotlight. So. What do but, you have to say to that? But, but this is the issue of criminality. It only takes one person with a knife to go on a knifing spree. This is the problem. Criminals do accept, uh, But when they do it in the name of Islam, it says something. The guy in the video... Well, actually, he did it in the name of revenge. Uh, a more A more secular... Um, well, re revenge for, for the Muslim community, community as a mm -hmm. community, which I, I don't think, uh, as Muslims, we should uh, uh, for, take, revenge. Do, take revenge. I think revenge is, is for God. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, they, they say why, they say it was revenge. Um, it, the founder of Al-Qaeda, when, uh, when he believed in uh, attacking uh, popular Western populations, he didn't say, he actually said that the, the Prophet Muhammad prohibited this, but we live in a, in a modern time where the rules aren't set in stone. So he's, a, he's a very much modern and modernist uh, uh, justifications. They are not Islamic theological justifications, which for centuries have forbidden the killing of civilians and the killing mm. of innocents. Mm. Mr. William Spring, to what extent do you buy into the rhetoric that the cause of what is happening now in Paris and in the West generally is a, a consequence of fighters going to Syria, getting training and coming back? I think that's a very <coughs> large element in it. I wouldn't say it's the whole story. Mm. And this is what we've been saying to the British government. They've sown the wind, they're reaping the whirlwind. They are the ones who have encouraged a postmodern view of the world in which violence against totally innocent people is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Tony Blair, the Labour Prime Minister, was the one who went into Iraq, killed hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be something we should be proud of. Of course we're not. And these men, like Blair 
mm. and uh, his acolytes, they should be brought to trial. Mm. Until that happens, we're not going to get any purgative, you know, catharsis mm. of mm. this situation. Mm. Mr. Andalusi, uh, to what extent could these events, could they have been avoided? Well, I, I think they could have been avoided pr primarily with um, uh, the French government, UK government, and US, um, and many such Western governments, not uh, in, in engaging in military operations in the Middle East, bombing and attacking other people's countries, and so on. then again, we're getting so back to sort of indirectly justifying. No, well, it's not justifying. It's about dealing with uh, causes. Uh, when we talk about crime, we say we must reduce poverty because this, this will cause. We don't say, oh, well, crime's justified when people are poor. No, no one's saying that. But when pe but people say that if there's a crime happening uh, amongst, amongst uh, certain areas of, in, in, a, in a country, it's, and there's poverty is, is, is a cause, we ha they target poverty. You can't target mm -hmm. uh, individuals who, uh, unless you, su you surveil every single individual in, in that country. So what we have to deal with is because we can't prevent... Uh, lone, uh, uh, lone criminals taking matters into their own hands and doing, uh, doing nasty crimes. All we can try to do, and all any politician or any people can try to do, is try to reduce uh, the causes which give rise to these individuals. And the causes are uh, grievance, uh, injustice, discrimination, uh, and, uh, and uh, hate-mongering against uh, minorities in, in the West. And as Islam has different uh, factions and it can include uh, different rhetoric, it's only fair to try and learn more of how they view these attacks in a democratic world. We are now joined by British lawyer and Muslim activist Anjum Chowdhury. Mr. Chowdhury, could you elaborate more on your recent tweets upon the Paris shooting? Upon the shooting? Mm -hmm. The Paris shootings, yes. yes. I mean, uh, what uh, I think that we need to understand in Islam is that there is a science called ikhtiyar, which is called assassination. And there are a number of people, really, in the time of the Messenger Muhammad, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like Kaab ibn Ashraf, Abu Rafi al-Yahudi, Khalid ibn Sufyan, uh, um, Asma bintu Marwan, etc., who used, to, who used to insult the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and whom he asked to be killed. Now, the question is... But that was back uh, then. Them, it was, it if, was a power game me, back then for the prophet. If you allow me to just prophet. finish my sentence, that mm. would be helpful. Of course. Some of, them, some of them were killed, in fact, and then the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was informed, and he consented. And others, he sent them, in fact, to assassinate. Now, the question is, obviously, I believe that this should be done by an Islamic state after being tried by a Sharia court. And then after that, if the penalty is fitting, then it should be implemented. But because of the narrations that have been uh, uh, related authentically from the time of the Prophet, there are some people who believe that the individual can fulfill it because the honor of the Prophet belongs to all of the Muslims. Now, this is, a, this is obviously a very serious issue because the value of the honor of the Prophet is something which is a matter of life and death for the Muslims. But back to Just your tweets, the, Mr. Chowdhury, yes. back to your tweets upon the events. Yes, what about them? You tell us. Well, this is what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to explain to you this topic is obviously extremely serious and it is a matter of life and death. And that's why people have fulfilled this before. We saw it with Theo Van Gogh. Obviously, people want to get hold of people like Salman Rushdie and others. So I'm basically explaining to you the Islamic jurisprudence. The problem is the vast majority of the people sadly will never get these sciences unless they study with ulama al haq like mm. Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad and others who will teach you things you know you will never see. I, I had a debate with one man from uh, Muslim Council of Britain. He never even heard of the topic, let alone the examples. So obviously people speak from their own desires. They don't know what the Islamic ruling is. And that's why it's very important to study your deen from people who are qualified as opposed to just following, uh, you know, the ideas and the false ideas, indeed, of democracy and freedom of speech, etc., sure. um, which uh, the Western governments want to feed you. Uh, I'd like to raise a contention from uh, Islamic jurisprudence on the matter. First and foremost, um, people that live in the West have a contract uh, of citizenship or, or a contract of a covenant of peace. They cannot, they cannot break that covenant. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade uh, treachery. Even if people are treacherous to you, goes the hadith, you can't be vigilantes uh, in Islam, especially when you've made a, co a, a contract. If the issue is rather if a state can employ uh, people to, to uh, go around the world and, 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 and attack people, that's a different matter. Of course, we know Israel sends Mossad uh, and it killed a Palestinian cartoonist who did uh, satire against Israel in England, uh, and no one raised really much issue ab about it. Uh, but uh, we have to follow the Islamic rules. 
Some people could also have said that if you look at the poetry that was written against the Prophet Muhammad at the time, it was actually inciting people to kill him. They were saying, who will uh, uh, cut off the head of this, of this, of this uh, man? And they were saying this in the, in the poetry, uh, and it was uh, inciting people to kill the Prophet so Muhammad. there's a difference there. Uh, many, peop uh, many people have argued, many jurists have argued that incitement to, ki to, to, to kill Muslims uh, is itself uh, the same as king committing murder and you mm -hmm. can commit self-defense, but it must be done by uh, a state-approved authority, by a duly constitute, cons uh, constituted state, not by vigilantes, not by people taking matters into their own hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chowdhury, to what extent is the attack, uh, apart from being a criminal act, of course, even though you might not agree, uh, to what extent it is a double standard act? I mean, you do support a Sharia law even here in Europe. You do praise the caliphate of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in the Middle East. And you do accept that under that very caliphate, marginalizing minorities, including Christians, is very common. So if that caliphate called the Islamic State is ideal, why don't you tolerate what you call harassment of Muslims in the West, particularly France, known for a very well-established Christian history? Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, just to respond to uh, Brother Abdullah, that there is in fact uh, uh, a genuine difference of opinion on the issue of Ahd al-Aman, the covenant of security, even though I believe that there is one in the West. Uh, there are many people who don't believe there is one. For example, the Shabab and obviously Al-Qaeda and even the Islamic State. So this is a difference of opinion that we have to embrace and understand why people do certain actions. And obviously the sanctity of an individual could be lost even though the covenant could remain. So it could be that there could be a certain permit to do certain things, but uh, your covenant always will remain with the people at large. Uh, not according to Islamic law, brother. These, these, no, these no, are that's the not detailed the... rules of uh, the covenant of security. Which let, let's, let's move on, on to my, to my question, please. Broad brush strokes and just yes. uh, no, the, put the, everyone on the same category. The, the, that, the Quran clearly says that, that if you fear, if you fear treachery from like people, you return back their covenant to be on equal terms. So so for a Muslim for a Muslim to be not under the law of France or or Britain or whatever, if they live there, they have to return back their covenant return back their citizenship, return back their, their passport, leave the country, then they can be on equal terms. They don't, they're not under the law. But as long as you accept the citizenship, uh, then you are under law. This is what the Quran uh, uh, argues. And there's I think no, the, Quran, no abandon, the Quran's opinion no is more authoritative, I think, uh, than Al-Qaeda and ISIS and Baghdadi. I know, I know you don't want to implement the Sharia yeah. wherever you are, which by itself is really uh, a statement of kufr, to say you don't want the Sharia wherever you are. I, 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 I want Sharia for Muslims. I want, I want Sharia for Muslims. Don't, uh, don't, don't, don't spin this. But Sharia is has never been on non-Muslims. The Prophet Muhammad saw uh, he got the, the, the Torah uh, and judged a Jew according to the Torah. So where, where, where was the Sharia uh, then for non-Muslims there? The Sharia is not imp imposed on non-Muslims. Yes. Please refer to the example of the Prophet Muhammad. Mr. Chowdhury, can you get back to my question, please? We, we got your point there with, with Mr. Andalusi. Can we get back to my main question, please? Because at the moment, I can't hear what the brothers just are speaking over me. So when you want to hear what I have to say, please follow me back. I mean, I can say my sentence. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Anjam Chowdhury. Always interesting talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, back to you, Mr. Spring. What do you have to say about this? To be honest, I just feel somewhat de depressed having listened to this gentleman just now. Quasi, because yes. um, it appears to me, and I don't understand why, that Islam has some sort of problem about violence. Now. Uh, Christianity, the, the, you can make comments about the Crusades and all this sort of thing, but the essential and intrinsic um, leader of the Christian religion uh, never uh, advocated violence. Indeed, on the night he was betrayed, he told his apostles to put away their swords. Looking about Jesus Christ, yes. of course. Yeah. And um, what I'm trying to say is it seems to be a negative sort of image that is somehow projected of Islam when it's a religion presented as a religion of revenge. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Jews have suffered enormous uh, iniquities in the Second World War from the Germans. Uh, the Palestinians have suffered enormous iniquities from the, <laughs> from the Israelis. And, and uh, you know, we, we all have many reasons for being outraged both at our own individual treatment and at the treatment of groups. But that is not the way forward for the world. Mm -hmm. We need a new type may, of thinking. May I just put, um, I mean, all due respect to obviously Christianity, Christian religion, um, 
Uh, Jesus, uh, he did get violent. He, he got violent once on, on the money lenders who were in the temple. He took some a whip and he whipped them out. When he comes back, he won't be um, Mr. Nice Guy. He will get, bring a sword and he will massacre um, disbelievers well, that was and so on. 2,000 years back, perhaps uh, uh, in uh, Saudi yesterday, uh, they were slashing people for blasphemy. Not just uh, blasphemy, uh, just uh, for uh, arguing. Uh, or I just know, but the religion. New Testament also says that all scripture is useful for, for yes. teaching and in, instruction in righteousness, including Old Testament laws of how to treat and politics, which Christians referred to in the Middle Ages, the Old Testament laws uh, on, how, and on how to treat criminals, or blasphemers, mm. heretics. Mm. So uh, there is that, 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 that issue in the, in, in, from Christian interpretation, but the issue with uh, the, the, uh, Andrew Chowdhury or, or uh, and certain terrorist groups, it's not Islam that motivates them to do this, these, these crimes. Osama bin Laden himself was asked by Al, Al Jazeera journalists about the matter, and he goes, uh, yes, it's, uh, the Prophet Muhammad did forbid the killing of innocents and, and so on, but it's not set in stone. This is mm. what he said. Mm. He's a modernist, he's a, he's a product of the post-colonial era, he learned. He cited America as an example. Said America doesn't care about civilians. They used uh, in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He cited America as his example. I'm sorry. I prefer the Prophet Muhammad as my example. And the Prophet Muhammad never uh, uh, took revenge for personal insults. He was abused. He was garbage mm. was thrown on him. This but it, but um, uh, Islam. We only uh, uh, engage in fighting for for uh, righteous uh, causes to defend the weak uh, and the oppressed and so on. Hopefully. But what's Mr. happened in yes. Nigeria is not defending the weak. I mean, we've just lost thousands of people in uh, two cities in, in north, northeast Nigeria since January the 2nd. The whole city or village or town has been uh, virtually eradicated and at least 2,000 people probably have been killed. This is according to Amnesty International. Mm -hmm. So we, what, what appears, now of course this isn't in the West, Mm -hmm. The West is more concerned with some journalists in Paris than with thousands of people in Nigeria who are facing terrorist outrages. In, in Central Africa, there are Christian militia, militias massacring a well, Muslim by the thousands, this, as well as Kony, the Lord's Liberation uh, Army, who's a, can, a uh, cannibal and uses Bible verses. You can find th these are militias who are adopting mm -hmm. the cloak of some kind of superficial justification from whatever is there in their yes. culture, but they are still militias and warlords, and that is the primary model to understand but them. Boko Haram seems to be a state of its own, with its own caliphate mm -hmm. in uh, Central Africa. Let's try and stay in Europe, Mr. Andalus. See, many Muslims suggest that they're not 100% comfortable in their own skin on European soil and the West in general. We're not talking here about Middle Easterners and North Africans only, but in generally Muslims, uh, even Asian Muslims, obviously. So what's the alternative for, for Muslims in the West? Well, I mean, there was a recent survey. Um, many, uh, there are many uh, British Jews report not feeling comfortable in Britain due to the rising anti-Semitism. I'm talking about right? Muslims. We'll I understand, come back I to the Jews. It's, the issue is we, we, we're too focused on it being Muslims and, oh, this has never happened before. This has happened so many times in European history in exactly the same circumstances with exactly the same things being said uh, uh, and so on. And it's just a repetition of history. The, the reasons why uh, Muslims are feeling uh, uh, uncomfortable now is not because of um, Western values or particular culture. It's because they're being denied uh, rights, they're being arrested for expressing uh, th their opinions. Like Azhar Ahmed expressed his opinion, he was denied free speech. Um, Samina Malik wrote a poetry, didn't even publish. She was uh, uh, convicted for that poetry of glorifying terrorism. I mean, yes. uh, uh, the, the Muslims are denied these, the, the, the rights. In front, the French community had it worse than the British community, uh, the, the, the Muslim community in, in France. Yes, but what's the alternative so, for Asians or Muslims it, who are not comfortable with this? No, no, I, no, I would say that the alternative is for um, there to be campaigning for, so that uh, Western governments stop treating Muslim minorities as some uh, strange alien group uh, and denying them uh, the same rights as everybody Prime else. But the Prime Minister, recent, not, not recently, every year the Prime Minister, be it a Tory government or a Conservative government, they do a televised speech, for instance, on Eid to celebrate Eid and to celebrate their minorities. I don't see that in the Muslim world to celebrate minorities, be it Yazidis or Christians. Okay, firstly, uh, many Muslim countries, um, uh, uh, certainly, Arab, certainly Arab countries as well, uh, Arab Christians and Muslims do s celebrate mutually uh, uh, festivals together and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. but that, that is, that's not that you uh, we can't make a generalization on that. And the opposite is actually the case. But I would prefer that the politicians are uh, silent during Eid and give me uh, the full freedoms of everybody else rather than be, uh, a pray, uh, be offering uh, congratulations during Eid but denying my freedoms in the rest of, the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. and all why why of my shouldn't Asiya Bibi be given freedom? She's in Pakistan, 
which is supposedly a law-abiding state. The government has gone back on any principles of Jinnah. Uh, um, is, it, this lady was thrown into prison uh, nine, about five, six years ago on a charge of blasphemy, which she denies. She's been sentenced to death and has been in the death row for the, all those time. Now, oh, surely the Pakistan government should show it's concerned about minorities. But however, the Pakistan government doesn't seem concerned about its own citizens as it tolerates these drone strikes mm -hmm. by the Americans. Yes. This yeah. morning in Brick Lane in East London, a sympathizer with Charlie Hebdo writes on his restaurant board, Je suis Charlie. His life is now threatened by radical, radical Muslims in the area. Now, uh, Mr. Spring, how could have incumbent or previous governments in the UK have avoided the ghettoization of London? I mean, we've seen the ISIS flag flown in Canary Wharf in the summer. We've seen pa brochures inviting British youth to go and join the caliphate in the streets of London. Well, this is a result of years of British policy in terms of um, immigration and so on. Uh, I am not in favour of unrestricted immigration. I'm in favour of immigration from the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. I'm not in favour of immigration from Eastern Europe on a whole, wholesale, indiscriminate, there's no, no borders situation. There's no situation. religious threat, though, from Eastern Europe compared to the Muslim world. No, well, a lot of working class people in Britain don't regard it merely as a, as a religious threat. They regard, they're worried about economic threats. Yes. Now, uh, we are joined by uh, Father Frank Gelli, commentator and critic. Thank you very much for being on the show. My pleasure. Father Frank, you wrote recently a piece where you sort of reflect on France under Napoleon Bonaparte and you imagine how he would have dealt with the cartoon issue if he were leader nowadays. Tell us more about this. Well, of course, um, Napoleon is possibly the greatest Frenchman. He was a deeply tolerant man. He was interested in religion. He had read the Quran. He was an admirer of Prophet Muhammad. When he was in um, Egypt, uh, he even contemplated converting along with his whole army to Islam. But he didn't do it because the conditions were not right. But as far as uh, Charlie Hebdo is concerned, the basic point here is, would uh, the ruler of the French, the French emperor had tolerated the publication of a document which would have caused um, uh, dissent, discord, and even uh, strife amongst his own population. I don't think he would have. But of course, I hasten to say, he was not in favor of um, uh, complete uh, freedom of the press. So the dilemma here is, can we have total freedom of, of the press with consequences such as we've seen, or do we have a paternalistic regime like the one of Napoleon, well, not exactly like him, which actually monitors and censors what is being published. It is a dilemma. Mm. Where do you think the French government went wrong anyway in supporting Charlie Zebdo? Well, I mean, I'm not a Frenchman. Um, You're so European, I, I, so... Uh, uh, yes, indeed, but, but my point here, I don't exactly have the same big feelings that the French have. Um, I think that once Charlie Hebdo was published, once the journalist had been murdered, there was no choice for the government but to support the journalists, because we got to draw the line at assassination. We, I myself as a Christian, I'm hurt of some of the things Charlie Hebdo published, but assassination, murder, is something we must absolutely draw the line. Exactly at. there. And where, where does the Anglican Church differ from Islam in its reaction towards harsh criticism to its symbols, namely Jesus Christ, be it in cartoons or otherwise? Well, you know, the Church of England is incredibly liberal, incredibly permissive. It is so open-minded that there is a joke. It, uh, its braids have dropped out of it. So the Church of England really doesn't have a big issue with uh, satire. But of course, there was, until fairly a few years ago, on the statute book, a crime of blasphemy, but it was only directed at those who insulted the Protestant religion. And it's 
it's been abolished now. So there is no longer crime of blasphemy on the statute book. The Church of England is up for, um, you can take the Mickey out of the Anglican Church and the symbol as much as you like, and I'm the first to do so. Mm -hmm. Father Frank Gelly, let me just remind you before we thank you for joining us that despite his victorious uh, uh, events in history, Napoleon Bonaparte said throughout his life that the greatest day in his life was the day of his first communion as a Catholic or confirmation. So maybe not very sure there that he was seriously contemplating a change of religion. Anyway, thank you very much for being with us today, Father Frank Gelly, MA in Islamic Studies and an Ox holding an Oxford Certificate in Theology and also an MA in Islamic Studies. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Andalusi, back to you. What are the main issues here in the UK when it comes to government policies towards Muslims? Sure. I mean, before I answer that, I'll just quickly say, ironically, Napoleon Bonaparte was a dictator and he wasn't a democracy, <laughs> even though he was I a very... I didn't say it was, he was, it was, yes. Yeah, he was a, a, lib yes. uh, a liberal secular ruler. Mm. Um, but and also another point is, uh, I mean, uh, Afia Bibi is, is, is an issue, but also Asya Siddiqui is also another issue. She was uh, detained by the Americans for, for life, uh, and she's, uh, she's more likely innocent. Okay. And so, so there's injustice um, uh, happening to her. We have to also remember her as well. But to, to get into the issue of the, the question, you said what are the main issues that, that Muslims in the UK face, um, we face, uh, we face the, the, a, a, a Tory government uh, which uh, are, want to fight a war against uh, non-violent extremism, uh, and they want to increase laws to get to get, make, get people who uh, don't fall uh, who fall uh, below the law, and, and I think it's very worrying is that they want to increase laws to catch more people to catch people who are not criminals for expression. It costs a lot to lock people up anyway. Why would the British government intend to lock them up? Well, it, it's because um, they, fundamentally is not even locked up. Despite all what he says, yeah, he was arrested. Uh, he was arrested, he was arrested once, arrested and, 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 um, quit, and some of his colleagues are, have absconded uh, to, mm. to Syria. Um, uh, but the, the issue is that there are many Muslims who have uh, been locked up, and the reason being is because uh, in the West, uh, in certain so historical circumstances, it has never been tolerant of uh, ideologies or beliefs which it views as rivals. So, um, communism. A uh, hundred years ago, it was uh, uh, Jews or uh, uh, what they perceive as threat, though. Uh, well, it, well, it, well, Islam is. I mean, if, if that's the case, then that's very worrying. If you Islam is Islam because is. of what? It's, it's because of well, the agendas of the Muslim communities, which well, go beyond practicing religion. Uh, uh, well, well, I mean, ultimately, uh, the, 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 the threat that Islam poses to, to the West is really just to the government foreign policy of extracting resources, of having a con strategic control of the Middle East. Okay. And Islam would encourage I an independent entity uh, uh, which would resist that and would, uh, would uh, be uh, fight, fight against capitalism and exploitation of uh, minorities. Mm -hmm. and, and it would, and not just in amongst Muslims, but also amongst non-Muslims uh, uh, in, in Africa and other countries which are also being exploited. So uh, this, this issue which they've raised, they don't want to see a, a, an entity in the Middle East that will resist uh, their, their control, resist their puppet governments, mm -hmm. and resist their uh, economic exploitation. Of course, ultimately, Islam poses, poses that threat, and they don't want to see it uh, re-emerge uh, to, to challenge that mm -hmm. you know, global capitalism. Mr. Spring, do you... Do you believe, do you have similar thoughts on that? Actually, I do. I think the, there's no well, where explanation. Where do you differ? Where do you differ? Well, well I differ on the grounds that uh, much of the anti-libertarianism of uh, certain groups or certain individuals in the Islamic community seems to derive from authoritarianism per se, mm -hmm. which is in turn sanctified by their holy texts. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I'm opposed entirely to the British government. For example, they, they brought in a statute that uh, make it a criminal offence to glorify terrorism. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a dreadful event mm -hmm. um, because that was the beginning of dictatorship. Mm -hmm. or In fact, it, not the beginning. It was quite a long way down the road by the time they brought that in. Mm -hmm. And Theresa May, I think, I'm not sure whether it was Theresa May or the other woman before here. Yes. But it, it's, we're in a dreadful situation because what we've got is a complete failure of the secular experiment in the West. We've had a secular experiment, now the, which has failed. Would it have been better to get back to, to, to religion? Well, I think that England was a happier country mm. when we knew 
uh, you know, when we knew where the Queen was, we knew, we knew our place, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and the religion of the country was more or less uniform. It was Christian, Pretty and there were Catholics, yeah. Yeah. whatever. Yes. Yes. But uh, there wasn't... What happened in France is very different, though. Mm -hmm. France divided immediately after the revolution into two groups, the clericalists and the uh, Robespierre-type people who believed in, you know, killing off the, cler the clericalists and destroying mm -hmm. the church. And they invented terrorism. At the actual yeah. word, it was invented by, by them, terrorism. Uh, yeah. The mm -hmm. rule by terror. Uh, the, the secular revolution uh, in introduced that. And now we are joined by Arzu Mirali, Head of Research at the Islamic Human Rights Commission in London. Welcome to our discussion on Straightforward Levant TV. Uh, Mrs. Mirali, the, I the IHRC has formally discontinued its long-standing policy of engaging in government anti-terrorism consultations. Tell us more about this news and why did you choose this timing particularly? The decision we actually made towards the end of last year, looking at the new uh, bill that was currently going, being, you know, speed pushed through Parliament, it's actually going to be law probably by the end of this month, which is incredibly fast for something that was only mooted, you know, a few weeks back. Um, we've always opposed all the anti-terrorism laws that have been implemented since we've been an organization, which is since 1997. And in fact, that year, there was the first of this kind of raft of anti-terror laws introduced. Do you say all terror, law, all terror laws, even those affecting or the, the ones that are crucial for the security of Britain? Well, we argue they're not crucial for the security of Britain. What they are doing is making it incredibly insecure. It's, they have eroded civil liberties. They've created a third tier of the legal system, which really only affects Muslims and it's subpar. You know, it, is, uh, it holds Muslims to a different level of accountability and it also has lower burden of proof, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we've basically sleepwalked into a police state and we got to a point at the end of last year where although we have been repeatedly submitting our points, our objections, et cetera, to different consultations, we began to realize that this process in itself simply just legitimates the fact that the state is has been out of control in, in implementing these laws and that really what we need to campaign for. Mr. Spring here would like to interject and tell us more about yes, this. I'm clear that the state is out of control. And, um, for example, we used to have a thing called habeas corpus. Yes. No one could be denied a trial. Exactly. This idea of, of house arrest, of locking people up and throwing away the key, um, a, a lady in Guanta a, a, a prisoner in Guantanamo Bay, who's a British resident, only last year did David Cameron raise his uh, treatment with the President of the United States. I, whatever, however bad things are here, though, they are a thousand times worse in the USA because they seem to be well prepared for a system of concentration camps, not only at Guantanamo Bay, but throughout the world. Diego Garcia is one of them, which is a British colony. I think we should break the alliance with America. If they don't, if they don't release this re resident, uh, I forget his name now, who's... Shaka Armour. Yeah, if they don't release him now, within the next 24 hours, I think we should just tell the American ambassador in London to push off. Arzu Mirali, um, you believe that Prime Minister David Cameron's government tends to exploit terrorist attacks to widen the powers of the security services and erode fundamental freedoms and further target and marginalize the Muslim community here in Britain. Now, on this occasion, Foreign Secretary Theresa May insisted that this has nothing to do with Islam. So what's your take on that? Well, you know, we often get these sound bites that this or that has nothing to do with Islam, but the actual practicalities and implementation of all the laws and policies is that it targets Muslims, it targets Islam. And to be fair to David Cameron, it's not just his government, it's the previous Labour governments as well that have been instrumental in setting us on this course. And what we've had are policies like Prevent, uh, the contest policy. All of these are actually have seen the state wanting to intervene in Muslim communities and also to actually set out what is normative Islam. Yes. They are actually trying to socially engineer what it is that Muslims should believe in. Mm -hmm. And they have tried to criminalize and at the very least demonize mm -hmm. Muslims on the basis of views that they may or may not have, whether they believe in any kind of political Islam 
yes. whether that's a uh, khilaf or whether that's Vilayat al Saki, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they've, uh, you know, lambasted the Muslim community as homophobes, as anti Semites, etc. Assuming that is a general case, uh, do you agree that freedoms have sometimes been exploited from the other side, from some factions, some factions within the British Muslim community? We've seen leaflets inviting British youth to join the Islamic State during the summer on high streets in London. Okay, but the point is that if that's the freedom for everyone, that's the freedom for everyone. And the thing is, you have this kind of weird, minuscule minority, literally maybe, you know, 10 to 40 people. Do you disown them? Given the uh, oxygen of publicity over and over again are allowed to do these things Mm. and kind of create an atmosphere where, you know, it then justifies all sorts of backlash Mm. against the rest of the Muslim population. And what you actually do find is that people who legitimately want to protest about Palestine and other issues are demonized. They criminalized. I mean, we had an appalling spate of arrests after the pro-Palestinian demonstrations in 2008-9, which targeted only Muslim protesters, and people mm. got custodial sentences. You know, somebody got 18 months for throwing an empty plastic bottle at the gates of the Israeli, the locked gates of the Israeli embassy. Mm. I mean, well, can you imagine? Yes. What do you have to say, or what are you doing as a Muslim community to help? Uh, remove this stigma from from you. You said it's only a couple of Muslim people in the UK that gives you this bad stigma. What are you guys doing to to remove this stigma? Are you disowning them? Are you condemning them? Are you going out with statements that they are not true Muslims and you are the the, the truthful Muslims? And the, the, what are you doing about it? I think if we start going around saying that we're the truthful Muslims, we'll be doing being as outrageous as those people who are claiming you know, to the most outrageous things in the name of Islam. We, we have just, to be very we just careful had, about we, representation. True, but just, I think your, your question is really the wrong way around. I mean, we are a minority, and minorities cannot so explain you, to everybody everything all the time. It's just a demographic and practical impossibility. And ultimately, mm. it's not their responsibility. You know, there are things like minority rights, which the responsibility for implementing which come uh, lie on the shoulders of governments. You know, it is the role of government to ensure that the population as a whole has a correct idea about those people in minority situations who are not readily understood. Mm-hmm. And we've seen effective uh, work on this in my lifetime, although it's slightly going the wrong direction now on the issue of anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. We've seen it on the issue of sexuality. You know, when I was growing up, homosexuality was completely taboo. Now it's very mainstream and, and it's, it's a norm of, of society. You know, if you actually want to criticize that, you will actually be the person who's being lambasted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is what, that is the role of government, you know, and that's what they should be doing in the case of Muslims. It's not up to Muslims to... Very briefly, brother, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdullah Al-Andalusi would like to uh, add something here. Yeah, I just want to say that I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Sister Ar- Ar- Arzu, and it, it, was, it was a great uh, enunciation. Um, the, and the issue is really the, who gives oxygen of publicity to uh, a, certain, a certain individual uh, is, unfortunately, it is the media. Mm-hmm. If the media uh, uh, didn't give him a pl- platform, we'd never hear of him. Uh, uh, we'd never hear of him again. Certainly, the, the mainstream Muslim community never give him platforms. So the only people who are giving him platforms are the mainstream media. And then the same media asks Muslims, "What are you doing to uh, to uh, reduce his voice?" But if they are in it, the streets of London in massive demonstrations, don't no, you expect uh, the media to talk to ma- them? Massive? What? Thirty people? Massive. Twenty people? Yeah, I can have a wedding celebration with more in- invitees how, than how he has does members. How the West differentiate? They think they're all Muslims. You cannot blame. Can you? You blame the West I, I, for well, not I, I differentiating? Think that's, I, I think that's, that's no, really... No, you can't, sorry, blame ordinary people. Sorry to interrupt you, Brother that's Abdullah. Right. And this is something that we're very keen to stress in our research work. Yes. You know, in a way, ordinary people are as much the victims of Islamophobia as Muslims are because they mm-hmm. are relying on the government, they are relying on the media for correct information about people that they that, you know, can't readily access. And what they're being fed is a diet of demonization. I mean, how is it that anyone can say there are masses of people supporting people like this? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 20 or 30 people. Mm. It is up to government to be very clear in educating the population at large. And what they're actually but doing then you stopped is feeding a with them. feed you of demonization. You stopped cooperating with the government, ma'am. Sorry? You just stopped cooperating with the British government on that. No. We've stopped having consultation on the anti-terrorism laws. Mm-hmm. You know, you're conflating a basic issue of social justice, which is the end of racism and discrimination against mm. all peoples, mm. and particularly minorities, with security. I mean, that's demonization. You're, mm. you know, perpetuating all those uh, racist tropes about Islam- about Muslims. Mm. Arzu Meirali, also co-founder of the Islamic Human Rights Commission, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.
And moving on to the attack on near uh, Roissy, Charles de Gaulle Airport, on the kosher shop. Now, uh, Mr. Andalusi, what do you think of what happened there? Why the Jews are paying the price again? Well, um, I think there were, there were two different uh, groups involved. Um, one was the Al-Qaeda in Yemen, who those, those the two individuals identified themselves with. And the other is, uh, it seems to be a, a lone wolf attack by a guy who calls himself ISIS, um, reminiscent of the um, Australian hostage uh, attack. And, um, and, I, and anyone who knows about ISIS and Al-Qaeda know that they don't like each other very much at But what do the Jews uh, represent all? to such a radical, like the people who, who did the, the attack on the kosher store, or even on Charlie Hebdo? What, how, what, how do they see a Jewish community? Well, um, I mean, first and foremost, uh, you know, Muslims and, and anyone shouldn't be attacking any minority or, or any people or any even majority even uh, at all whatsoever. And uh, th there's no justification. This no one's talking about this. But the, if you look at the 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 group that the individual identified himself uh, with, uh, ISIS and so on, uh, these people uh, don't follow um, n necessarily a, a rational view of the world in terms of. Uh, 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 problems and issues. So the, their attack on uh, Jewish community was perhaps them conflating uh, Zionism and Israel with, with them. And they're, they're different things. Uh, Jews, Judaism is a different thing to, uh, to Zionism and you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't conflate it. And even if they were uh, Zionists in France, I, I just want to add, it doesn't mean that a person can be vigilante and kill them anyway. So I'm not saying that either, but I'm saying that basically that they've distorted in the, uh, the, the Jews with Zionism and they've went after to attack them illegally in the first way, even if they weren't Jews and Zionists. But mm -hmm. the, the conflation makes it even worse uh, because it's not, it's not accurate anyway and it, and it was you know, f uh, wrong. Well, and I, as I, it, yes. I think it's extraordinary, though, that march in Paris, that at the head of the march, or one of the leaders of the march, was Netanyahu, who <laughs> only a few months ago was knocking hell out of Gaza with very irrespective, very little consideration of women and children in that limited space where he's sending his American jets in to bomb and uh, it's just amazing. And I think that um, it was good that, in one sense, that there was Jewish representation. And you've got to remember that the anti-war movement, which I was involved with, always had a Jewish representation with Orthodox Jews, Muslims, uh, Christians, those of no faith whatsoever. We all gathered at Hyde Park to protest, millions of us, against the war in um, Iraq. Now, what we need to do, I think, is reconstitute that coalition. Mm -hmm. And as the Jewish community in France is yet another time targeted, this time with four civilians killed at a kosher store, let's talk to Mr. Richard Millet, journalist and political commentator who happens to be Jewish. Mr. Millet, first let me extend our sympathy over the shooting. Uh, Mr. Millet, BBC chief Danny Cohen said, anti-Semitism makes me question Jews' future in the UK. I've never felt so uncomfortable being a Jew in the UK as in the last 12 months, unquote. Mr. Millet, what is the general sentiment today amongst the Jewish community? Uh, yes, thank you for having me. Well, as we've just heard from your colleague there from the Stop the War movement, it's those kinds of sentiments that makes it very uncomfortable being uh, Jewish in the UK these days. There's this kind of, you know, we love Jews, but we hate Israel, that we hate Zionism. Well, actually, Zionism and Judaism are quite close. Many, many uh, Jew, Jewish people around the world are, in fact, uh, Zionists, are, in fact, supportive of Israel. But it's the Stop the War movement. It's the sentiments of many British MPs who are anti-Zionist, which is, to a certain extent, very, very anti-Semitic, very, very anti-Jewish, because anti-Zionist means that... Uh, they yes, desire. let me just clarify, Mr. Millet, that we don't have any guests from Stop the War Coalition. That would have been Mr. Abdul Al-Andalusi speaking, and he's an Islamic uh, activist. But anyway, back to my question, Mr. Mr. Millet, how would you compare, and do you think the, the, the BBC chief's uh, quote was quite sinister back then? I mean... Why would he say so? Would you concur? Well, I mean, there are many Jews who, who, who are very uh, scared of being in yes. Europe at the moment. Tell us we, more why. 
Because as, as you've just seen what happened in France. And but he France said it before. He's, uh, let's go back to December. Well, France isn't that far away from Britain. And not just uh, what happened in France last Friday, but two years ago, four Jewish people were yes. killed uh, outside a school in Toulouse. Mm -hmm. In 2006, another Jewish Frenchman, Ilan Halloumi, was uh, kidnapped and tortured to death. And France isn't very far away f from London. And, and there have been rising anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish attacks in, in Britain, which have been uh, caused by sentiments of those from people who do represent the anti uh, war, stop the war coalition, because these people are very, very anti-Israel, very, very anti-Zionist. And now, you know, we, we've seen that the Muslim community uh, is offended by comments or by cartoons uh, that, that have been portrayed in, in the media. Mm -hmm. But uh, people are freely expressing in Britain very, very uh, hostile comments to Israel and towards Zionism and Jews on the whole, not all of them, but many Jews, the majority of Jews, are very supportive of Zionism and are very supportive of Israel. I have to interject. Um, first and foremost, uh, I don't think all Jews uh, support Zionism. I think there's, there's, I didn't there's, say there's, that. there's I didn't there, say they okay, sure, fine. There are Christians uh, who are, are professed to be Zionists, so there is no intrinsic connection between the political ideology of Zionism and a race or religion or Judaism of or, or Jews. Of there, there is, is. no, there is no uh, intrinsic uh, connection, and there I think is. many Jews would be very, is. many Jews would be very offended uh, to be uh, to, to, to say that they're not Rubbish. real Jews unless they support uh, Zionism and so on. In fact. Before um, World War II, the majority of Jews didn't believe uh, in Zionism. It's a very secular, very recent and modern ideology and, uh, and, and, and not historically reflective of Jews. But I will say this, uh, I, don't, I think it's a bit rich, perhaps, uh, him talking about uh, freedom of expression or freedom, when we know that many things in France were banned, uh, considered to be uh, uh, anti-Semitic gestures, anti-Semitic cartoons, anti-Semitic comments, even in England, things are, uh, many uh, people are censored or, or, or reprimanded, uh, like, like, like the recent BBC uh, journalist, for things that were deemed to be anti-Semitic, merely well, they, for, for making do, uh, for fair, making they do get reprimanded for, for sort of insinuating or targeting Islam indirectly or criticising as a journalist, I'm saying. So uh, I, 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 I wish I could I, I yet to see but that. Let's, I, let's get like back to, to politics, example. Mr. Millet, from a political perspective. You seem to define proxy enemies as being, uh, especially in the Middle East, Hezbollah, for instance. But then the Islamic State is Hezbollah's enemy. How is that going to complicate things when Hezbollah is a threat in the homeland and ISIS seems to be a threat on European soil? Well, I mean, they're all terrorist groups. ISIS. Hezbollah, Hamas, these are all recognized Most terrorist sad. groups and they are in, in there is, you know, they are fighting each other uh, at, at the moment and there are problems with that because the likes of Hezbollah complicate things by getting involved in Syria uh, and they are supporting a regime of another country against... Uh, but why does the, ISIS target Jews in Paris while basically they haven't targeted Israel in the Middle East? ISIS targets Jews because ISIS at the moment can't target Israel. But as we've seen, ISIS is threatening Jordan, and Israel is actually probably supporting Jordan mm -hmm. to maintain its frontier. So Israel, Israel is obviously scared. Israel has fought wars against Hamas and against Hezbollah. Both organizations are dedicated to the destruction of Israel and to the murder of Jews. And unfortunately, Jews in Europe and in South America are indefensible because uh, against the likes of uh, the, the, the Karachi brothers who, who, uh, and his accomplice who find it easy to walk into an un indefensible mm -hmm. kosher Jewish shop and kill innocent Jewish people. That's Richard, why many people are going to Israel because they feel it's safer to go and live in Israel than at the moment living in Europe. I don't follow how you can say it's safer to go and live in Israel. It seems to be an extremely dangerous place to live. Not at all. Have you, no, not at all. I mean, that's why many Jews are making Aliyah. That's why many Jews from, from France it, are it, making uh, their way if that, to if the If that was the case, Israel. if that is the case, then it, it, it condemns um, Benjamin Netanyahu even more for attacking Gaza. If the Jews are more safer, are safer in Israel than in Europe, and Benjamin Netanyahu does justified the protection of Jews in Israel by flattening Gaza, then it's even worse indictment 
on Benjamin Netanyahu for, for doing so. If the Jews are, uh, uh, and so Israelis are, 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 are totally fine and safe in Israel, then, it, then there was no justification for him to go and flatten um, other, other, other places, other lands in their, in their name. And I think that it's a worse indictment on Benjamin Netanyahu. You've just condemned him more, thank you. You just condemned him uh, for, uh, uh, using, for, for flattening uh, Gaza by use of saying that he's protecting uh, Israel, which is vulnerable at, at that time. Mr. Miller, just a quick response before we end this episode. Well, the, the attack was against Hamas, but it, it, it's shocking that you, from your comments, feel that you, I can feel your desire to a certain extent that uh, it upsets you that Jews are safe in Israel. And that just says a lot about it your doesn't, political it, views. I, I, don't want, I don't want anyone to be endangered. I don't want, I don't want any human being mm. to be killed or, or, or imperiled. Uh, but it's because I don't want that to happen. It is, I, do, I speak out for what happened in Gaza, and I speak out for, for what yes. happened around let's, the world, for those who are, haven't been imperiled and have been killed and massacred by uh, uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu. <clears throat> Mr. Millet, do you have any plans as a Jewish community? Do you think plans that would be implemented to to raise more protection, as you said, you are threatened as a minority. Well, I mean, that's a very good point. But yeah, there are security being added to Jewish schools and there's more security being added to Jewish places of worship. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just being added. It's always been the case in Britain. If you go to any Jewish event, if you go to any Jewish school, if you go to any uh, synagogue, uh, not just now, but before what happened in France, there is massive security. Without that mm. massive security, Jews wouldn't be able to live in this country. Mm. Richard Millet, journalist and political commentator, thank you very much for talking to us during these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you. And as this episode comes to an end, we do hope violence comes to an end too. I'd like to thank our guests here at the studio, British political commentator, Mr. William Spring, and uh, it's Muslim activist Mr. Abdullah Al-Andalusi and by order of appearance over the phone our guests Mrs. Arzu Mirali and uh, Mr. Uh, Father Frank Galli, Galli and Mr. Anjum Chowdhury and uh, our uh, last interlocutor Mr. Richard Millet. Stay tuned and we will be with you again with some more interesting debates on Straightforward Levant TV.